Hello there. My name's Sam and I'm the minister at Melton Mowbray Baptist Church. Welcome to Teaching Stream. We're currently going through a series called Exodus, a Foundation, and this session is session two, and it's called The Baby in the Basket. So in session one last week, I introduced you to the book of Exodus. We had a talk about some of the overarching themes, and we looked specifically at how we can use Exodus to help us to transition through times of suffering because we place our hope in the God who saves and who has demonstrated him, himself to be the God who saves, sustains and comes through suffering to a place of salvation. We talked about how that salvation was a gift of grace, not because we have done anything good or wonderful, and we talked a little bit about the specific situation of the Israelites under oppression in Egypt. This week, the story moves on, but it is set very much in the same context of the suffering people of Israel in Egypt 400 years after Joseph brought Jacob and his family to that place. And this week we are introduced to one of the main characters of this book. In fact, the main character beside God Almighty himself. And that is, of course, Moses. Today we're going to be introduced to Moses as a baby. We hear that he has a pure Israelite heritage, uh, that he is the son of two Levites uh, that were married. We find out the way in which God utilises a situation that is evil to bring about the salvation of his people. We find out how Pharaoh repeatedly underestimates women, but God Almighty does not, and he uses them incredible, in incredible ways that in the end will bring about the salvation of the Israelite people. And we see how when we are up against situations where people intend evil, God will turn that evil and use it for the good of all of his people. So, as we move into this next stage and the big introduction to Moses himself, I'm going to ask you to read the passage that comes up on your screen and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. Obviously, the first verse that you read today is quite difficult reading. It is the command from the Pharaoh effectively to commit genocide against the Israelite people. He says that every boy that is born is to be thrown into the River Nile. One of the things that might be uh, interesting for us to think about at this time is that the Nile was one of the Egyptian gods. He was um, one of the idols of Egypt. Uh, they praised the Nile and actually it was kind of like they were giving these babies over as a mixture of a sacrifice to the Nile, but also the God himself was dealing with this problem for Pharaoh. So the whole story that follows after this uh, proves the God to be an idol, interestingly, and God Yahweh, the God of the Israelite people, proves himself to be the true and living God. Now, that reminds us of the context that we are in. We are in the context of deep oppression of the Israelite people. The Israelite people are walking through a dreadful time of suffering. They are enslaved. They are being worked as hard as they possibly can be. They are being abused. Midwives have been told to kill the boys. And now we have an absolute ban on boys. The Pharaoh has set an edict that every Israelite boy is to be thrown into the Nile. And it is in this context of extreme persecution that has just slipped into genocide that we are introduced to the hero of our story. And I, I don't mean that in the sort of uh, superhero sense. I mean that in terms of narrative structure, the central character, Moses. Moses comes into the scene at this time as the Pharaoh's 
oppression has become genocidal. Now, what is made clear by the writer of Exodus is that Moses is solidly a Israelite, that there is no uh, Egyptian in him. He is the son of both a mother and father who are both Israelites. In fact, more than that, they're from the same clan. They are Levites. Later on in Exodus, in chapter six, we get a fuller genealogy of Moses. Uh, You can read that if you like. It's worth remembering, though, if you do read it, that this was before the rules were set around marrying um, members of your family, uh, because actually Moses' mum and dad were nephew and auntie within the Levite family. So we get this picture of a Levite of Levites. It's interesting in terms of echoes with Jesus's story and his genealogies. It is made very, very clear that he is in the Davidic line. And if we're to understand tradition correctly, that he is in the Davidic line, both from his father's side and from his mother's side. Uh, And that's obviously Joseph, his adoptive father. And here, with Moses, it is made clear that he is a Levite among Levites with both a mother and father from the Levite clan. This makes extremely clear that God uses someone from within the people of God to bring about salvation. And it's very important that we understand that as we look at the rest of the story and also as we look at Jesus Christ's story. It is of vital importance that Jesus springs solidly out of the Jewish heritage and the Jewish people. In the same way, it is important that Moses springs forth out of the Israelite people. And as I say, he is from the Levi clan. Levi, one of the sons of Jacob. So Moses is born in this time of great oppression and his mother, seeing something in him, an interesting uh, idea, seeing that he was, the Hebrew word means uh, beautiful, special. I, I don't understand really how that's beyond what any mother sees when they look at their child, but it, it is to indicate something rather big. Uh, in fact, the same word is used when God looks at creation in the Genesis story and he says that what he has created is good. In the same way, Moses' mother looks at Moses and knows that he is good. So it has a lot of weight to it. That doesn't necessarily mean that she had some kind of prophetic insight into what Moses was to do, although she may well have done. There's nothing to stop us from believing that. But she believed that it was worth defying the law of Egypt. It was worth defying the law of the Pharaoh. It was worth risking the death of herself and her family to protect this boy because this boy was good. And so for three months, she manages to keep this baby under wraps. Now, that actually sounds like it might be really hard. But when we understand that Aaron was not that many years older than him, you can excuse the noises of the baby by saying, oh, no, it's our toddler. Uh, There were other children in the house. But we understand that actually after three months, why it suddenly becomes harder to conceal a child or any of us who have got three months old or had them recently will remember. It becomes very, very hard to conceal that baby. There's something that happens in the crying that is slightly different. And at this point, uh, this woman, this mother, again, someone who has been discounted by the system of the time, makes a bold and godly decision. She decides to save this child. And what she does is she creates a basket for Moses. She makes it out of papyrus, which we sort of know as the material that the Egyptians wrote on. And she tars it over so it becomes a special kind of little boat that is baby size. Now, the word that is used to describe the vessel that she creates, interestingly, is exactly the same word that is used to describe the ark in the story of Noah. 
And of course, this boat does hold the salvation of the people of God in the same way that in the ark it held the salvation of humanity and every animal in the world. And so this is what Moses' mother does. And we can imagine how heartbreaking this must be. She takes the baby, lays it in the basket, carries him to the Nile and leaves him in amongst the bulrushes. Now, interestingly, I don't know if you've spotted this, she's actually doing exactly what the Pharaoh has told her to do. She is throwing her baby son into the Nile. She is doing what is being asked of her. And in this way, we see how the God of the universe uses what is intended for evil for the good of his people. And so this baby is in the Nile, protected. We assume that Moses' mother understood that where she is placing this baby is near to where the rich Egyptian woman would come to the Nile to bathe. She expects that this baby will be found and cared for. And she goes away. Miriam, the daughter of Moses' mother. Miriam, Moses' big sister, waits at the side Interestingly, another woman. Interestingly, a daughter of the Israelite people. Israelite, interestingly, seen as not important enough by the Pharaoh of Egypt to drown. But in this situation, Miriam, a daughter of the Hebrews, a daughter of the Israelites, is the one that brings about the salvation of Moses. And the salvation of Moses brings about the salvation of the people of God. So this is the scene, the baby, the Hebrew boy is resting in the Nile in the bulrushes, Miriam watching over and he is about to be found by one of the most powerful women in the land. So the daughter of Pharaoh comes down to the Nile. She comes down to bathe with her servants and hangers on. And there something catches her eye. A beautifully weaved papyrus basket. And what's this that she finds inside? But a beautiful baby boy. picks him up, looks at him. And in that moment, God does something in her heart. She, she places pity on this child. She wishes to bring this child into her family. Again, a woman in a culture that underestimates women, but God does not underestimate women. He uses this daughter of Pharaoh, a member of his own family, to work against the evil he is doing to the Israelite people. And then another little girl calls out. The daughter of Pharaoh decides to adopt the child. And Miriam says, I know a woman who could nurse that child and raise him for you. The daughter says yes. And so what happens to Moses? We don't know whether it was in the space of a day or a week, but he goes back to be with his birth mother, to be fed by her breast, to be held in her arms. 
I mean, imagine she's walking around in the Hebrew quarters of Egypt. And they're saying, oh, what a lovely girl you've got there. Oh, no. This isn't a girl. This is my boy. Oh, shh, don't tell us that. Don't say that. No, no. I am able to call him my son, for this child has been adopted into the house of Pharaoh by his daughter. He has the protection of Pharaoh. And so, through what the Pharaoh had intended for evil, Moses is placed in exactly the place he needs to be. Now, we can get confused and wrapped up in whether God causes evil, whose choice it is. We're going to do a bit of that later on when we look at Pharaoh hardening his heart. But what is clear to me in the story of Moses is God uses what is intended for evil for good. And we can see that into the New Testament. You know, one of the things in Jesus' life story is the priests and the Romans who wished to kill him intended that to put down the rising up of his followers. Now, in human terms, actually, the miraculous thing that happened was after Jesus died, his followers grew. They became bigger. We, of course, know why. Because Jesus was the Son of God and he was resurrected. What they intended for evil became to the good of all of the people of God and all of humanity. An example in the early church is Stephen. So Stephen's preaching the good news and he is sentenced to death. He is stoned to death before Paul. Now, it is thought that this oppression would mean an end to the Christian sect of Judaism. Far from it. This oppression and the death of Stephen actually, in fact, spread the church out across the Roman Empire and took the good news of Jesus Christ out of its natural Jerusalem home to the rest of the world. In fact, we are a product of Stephen's execution. Now, I think that brings us to a really important point, and that is this. In the story of Moses, it becomes very easy to think that God has done this incredible thing without pain here. But it is important for us to recognise that many other Jewish boys were drowned in the River Nile. And this helps us to understand something. That God will use evil to bring about the good for all his people. But the blessings that we see, we may not see immediately ourselves. And the overall blessing may not feel very much like a blessing to the individual who is caught up in it. Sometimes we think of Christianity as being the life you always wanted. In fact, we have books that are written by that name. Now, I believe that God has an intention for all of our lives. I believe that God is going to utilise us. I believe that we have a God-given potential that through the Holy Spirit we may fulfil. But it is important that we remember that that was the case for Stephen. And his fulfilling of his God-given potential was to be stoned to death. God utilises what is intended for evil to bring about the good for all his people. But that journey is not straightforward and it does not come without pain. Moses has found himself in the right place. He is in the hall of the king of Egypt. He is a member of his family, adopted into that family. He will learn the language of the Egyptians. He will learn the culture. He will understand the way the palace works. And it uniquely places him to be able to speak to the Pharaoh in the way that he will need to 
as this story progresses. God has used the evil of a genocidal king to place the person of salvation into the place he needs to be to gain the skills and the abilities that he will need to free the Israelite people, the people of God. So today, as we see evil done in the world, evil done to the church, evil done to the people of God, as we see tyrannical rulers left, right and centre abusing the church, we have to cling on to the God who saves and the God who utilises evil intentions for good. If we think about the church in China, pushed underground, what happened? It grew exponentially. The thought of the communist government was that it would kill it. Far from it. In fact, the church has grown time and time again. What people intend for evil against the people of God, God will utilise for the good. Let's pray together, shall we? Loving Father God, we thank you for the story of Moses. We thank you for the baby in the basket. We thank you that you utilise situations that are intended for the harm of your people for the good. Lord, we thank you that you are with us. And when things happen to us which are intended for harm, you will turn them round for good. Lord, I pray that by your spirit you will give us the strength to walk through difficulty, struggle. And if it comes to it, persecution. Lord, I pray that you would remind us that in the midst of the most difficult situation, you are working things round for the good of your people. May we have a zoomed out enough view to know that that is bigger than our own experience of suffering. And loving Father, it would be wrong to talk of persecution without praying for the persecuted church. Lord, we pray blessing on our sisters and brothers in situations where they are not allowed to gather as your people, where they struggle to find a Bible and where being a Christian carries a death sentence. Lord, we pray blessing and protection on them. We pray that those churches would grow in spite of their suffering, in spite of their persecution. Lord, we pray that you would use all that is intended for evil against the church of Christ to bring about the good. Loving Father God, be present with our sisters and brothers around the world suffering in persecution and remind us to hold them in our hearts and to feel the pain of their persecution as we are damaged as part of the body. Loving Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for teaching us through your word. I pray that each of us would hear what you are saying to us today and throughout the rest of the week through this passage of scripture. Holy Spirit, bring to our mind those things that will bring about God's goodness in our lives and enable us to live lives that bring glory to and honour Almighty God. I ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Thank you for joining us for Teaching Stream. I hope you will be able to discuss this in one of our house groups. As I've said before, if you're not one of our house groups, small groups, then please do get in touch with Janet Gilchrist and she will help you to get into one of our home groups, which is right for you at the right time and on the right day. Thanks for being here. God bless you. And I will see you again next week.